Well, good morning. We're glad to have you here. You can stand with us. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. God, we thank you for another day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, I thank you that you love us and that despite whatever it is that we're going through, you care and we can come to you and lay our troubles before you. But right now we ask that you would be with us as we clear our minds and clear our head spaces so that we can prepare to be with you in your presence today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
night prayer and Bible study at 7 o'clock here upstairs for adults, downstairs for youth. They have their own program. Um, so bring them out, spread the word. Um, I don't have any other announcements at this time, but one of our, I'm not saying it's former, just because they no longer have their name on the room, but they are still our church family. Carol King and her family, her daughter, Rachel King, was um, killed um, last week this past week, so please keep their family in prayer. Um, if you have any more updates or anything, you will let me know. But please keep the King family in prayer, especially uh, Rachel's son, who was there to see it. So please, please, please keep their family in prayer. We will uplift them. And uh, that's all we got. God is good. Go ahead, Mario. Rachel's uh, funeral will be the 22nd of April. Which is Saturday, right? Yes. Do you know where? Uh, I don't know the top of my head. Thank you. Yeah, let's, uh, let's be sure to uh, post that. Um, praise the Lord, yes. Uh, let's pray for the family. Uh, look, prayer is effective. And the Bible says that the Effective, effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. So <clears throat> I can testify to that because on Wednesdays uh, we have a time of prayer, and we do re and we do ask for prayer requests. And I can tell you that God is answering our prayers uh, every week. We have a testimony of God answering one of the prayers that we that we lifted up to Him. Uh, so let's let's be in prayer. Let's pray. Uh, for this family, let's pray for peace. Let's pray uh, for healing, um, and uh, let's let's remember them. As the as Juanita said, just because uh, they're not uh, not here anymore doesn't mean they're not still members of this family. They will always be members of this family, and uh, you know I hope they know that. And uh, we, you know, if you know them, please reach out to them, and uh, you know provide some comfort. So praise the Lord. Uh, that's kind of a sad note to start on, <laughs> but, but praise God, life happens, right? Sometimes things things just don't always go the way we want them to, mm -hmm. uh, but God is good, Faith and as the word says, God works everything together for good. He didn't say everything would be good. He said he would work everything together for good, and so we believe that and trust in his goodness. How do we know that God is good? Because of the cross. Because, because he, he bled and died for us. As the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how he showed his love. And so we know that God is good because of the cross. So praise the Lord. So uh, we're going to switch gears here just a little bit. And we're going to uh, start a new uh, sermon series. Uh, I'm calling this sermon series, Unlikely Heroes. And I want to start today with uh, Abraham. Uh, we find uh, Abraham's story beginning in Genesis chapter 12. Now today, uh, I know we have great reverence for, uh, for Abraham, right? He was the father of the Jewish nation. Um, we know him as a, a faithful uh, servant of God. But uh, when we go back to the beginning of his story, right? We, we have to wonder, why, why did God choose Abraham specifically? I mean, was he the most righteous person on earth? Uh, I would say no. Because in uh, Genesis chapter 14, we're introduced to a, a person called Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, it says, was the king of Salem and a priest of God most high. So he was uh, a high priest back before even the temple uh, period of the Jewish nation. And uh, as a matter of fact, in Psalms 110, David prophesies of the Messiah saying that you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. <coughs> so Melchizedek is a, is a type of Jesus Christ. He's, he, he represents the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So I would say, if I were to look at that and judge, I would say that maybe Melchizedek was a little more righteous than even Abraham was, right? Right? So he wasn't the most righteous person uh, in the world. Okay, was he the smartest person in the world? I don't think so. 
See, twice in the Bible we read where he goes into an area and he tells his wife, tell everybody here that you're my sister because I don't want them to kill me uh, because of you. And both times it ends really badly. Now, I can understand making a mistake one time, right? So you go in, you do that once, it ends badly, and you think to yourself, maybe I shouldn't do that anymore. No, no, he goes ahead and he does it again. And, and it, you know, the consequences were even, were even worse the second time around. So I'm going to say that somebody who, who makes a mistake like that twice probably isn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. Right? So he's not the smartest person on earth. So what was it? What was it that was so special about Abraham? You want to know what was special about him? Nothing. There was absolutely nothing special about Abraham, and that's the point. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26-31, it says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, i gotta, I got to be honest, I'm not being falsely humble here when I tell you that I identify with this passage. Because uh, if, you, if, if you knew my history, you would understand that I also am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Now, I have made decisions. Now, Abraham made the same mistake twice. I've made the same mistake three and four times in my life before I got it through this little nugget here. <laughs> so, uh, I, I've made decisions that in my life that would make you doubt my sanity because I look back on it and I doubt my sanity when I look back at the decisions I've made. And so, I, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you might look at me, if you knew about my history, you'd probably wonder, what is he doing on the pulpit preaching God's word? And I often wonder that myself. I was like, I, I, came to, I came back to the Lord after being away, and I did not think that I would be a minister. I mean, I was called to the ministry at 15 years old, and I, I backslid. I, I went, I did my own thing, I, I, you know, I fell pretty far, and when I came back to the Lord, I was just happy to be saved. I'm like, praise God, I'm, I'm able to come home, I'm able to, to get forgiveness for my sins. I thought that was the end of it, and God said no. I called you at 15 years old, and that ministry still applies. So you might wonder, what is it, what is it that's so special about uh, Pastor Fernando? What is it that makes him qualified to be a minister? And I'm going to tell you, the same thing that qualified Abraham is the same thing that qualifies me. Nothing. It is the grace of God, period. It is simply by God's grace that I stand here today. And, and, and this is something that should hearten you. This is something that should be good news to you. Because you don't have to be the smartest person in the world to be used by God. You don't have to be the most righteous person in the world to be used by God. You know, you don't have to be the most eloquent person to be used by God. I, you know, I listen to, uh, to preachers uh, online all the time. Right? One of my favorites is, uh, is Dr. Tony Evans. And I love the way he speaks. I, I, I love how, how eloquent he is. And, and sometimes I wish I could talk like that. And, and I have to just shake my head and go, no, no, I, you know, God called me uh, specifically, and I have my own way of doing things, and I have to remember that. But I'm not the most eloquent person in the world. So you don't have to be eloquent or educated or, or any of those other things that we look at. You don't have to be well-dressed, right? Because I'm living proof of that, too. You don't have to be the most well-dressed person in the world. Now, I've known preachers who dress really sharp. And, and you know, people notice that. You know, you can tell when, when the preacher gets up on, 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 the, on the pulpit that, you know, everybody's eyes are riveted. You know, and I'd love to be that way. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Stan. <laughs> But I've seen that, you know, but that's just not me. I'm not, I'm not that guy that's going to wear a tie and I'm going to wear a nice tailored suit and all that stuff. Because, I, you know, 
That's just not what God called me to do. Now look, if, 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 if that's how God has called you, hey, more power to you. I'm not here to denigrate anybody's ministry. If God has, has told you to dress sharp to, in order to get people's attention, then you dress as sharp as God has told you to dress. But you don't need that. That's my point. You don't, you don't need anything except the call of God on your life. So, you know, that, that, should, that should be something that, that we receive with joy, knowing that, you know what, just because I'm not as educated as this other preacher or, or that person in the church, just because I'm not as good looking as that person or, or, you know, as eloquent as that person that God can't use me. No, no, God can use you simply because God is God. And he can choose you and use you for his purposes. And as a matter of fact, the less eloquent you are, the less wise you are, the more foolish you are, the more God might actually use you because he's, you know, he wants people to understand that it ain't about you. You know, we all get a lot of pride, right? We, you know, I, I do have a degree, and I was very proud of that. I, I, I studied really hard, and I worked really hard to get that degree. I'm very proud of that. But that doesn't mean I get to stand up here and say, hey, just because I have a degree and you don't, that makes me better than you. It does not. You know, I have a card in my, uh, in my wallet that says that I am a certified minister with the Assemblies of God. You know what that means? Nothing, okay? It doesn't mean anything as it, as it pertains to, to, to our relationship. It doesn't make me better than you because I have a card and you don't. You are still a minister of Jesus Christ. Just because you're not recognized by a denomination doesn't make you any less of a minister. You are a minister because God placed a calling on your life. Every one of us has a calling on our life. And that's the one thing I want you to understand. It's like, it, you know, whatever that calling is, it doesn't always have to be in the, in the pulpit. Sometimes your calling is simply to show love to people. Sometimes your calling is to show mercy to people. You know, that's what Paul says, that we all have different gifts. Just like the body has different parts and every part has its function, every one of us has a different gift and every one of us has a function in the church. <laughs> and you don't have to be the preacher you don't have to be the, the most educated person to be used by God. Because God will use you if you're willing. And that's the one, the one trait that Abraham did have. The one thing that Abraham had was that he was willing to be obedient. And that's the important part. It's not about your education. It's not about your breeding. It's not about whatever. It is about... Are you willing to obey? Are you willing to follow where God leads? Are you willing to go where God tells you to go? Now, I know that, especially in 21st century America, this is hard. Obedience is not a word that people like. It, it is not a word that people, are, that people receive easily. You know, obedience uh, has, has a connotation of being subservient, right? You know, when, when, you, when you think about that, and, and look, in America especially, we, we don't believe in subservience. I mean, we were, we were born, this nation was born out of rebellion, out of uh, questioning authority and rebelling against authority, and we have continued that in our society. That is the one trait that has endured in our society throughout the generations, is we don't want to be told what to do by anybody. And so obedience is hard. You know, and, and this is why uh, so many churches are empty now, because they don't, people want to believe what they want to believe. People want to do what they want to do. They don't want to believe that there's any requirement to act a certain way or to believe a certain way in order to get to heaven. Everybody, everybody thinks they're going to heaven, right? And it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to heaven. I'm a good person. No, the Bible says that there are no, there, there are no good people. There's no one that does good. We've all gone our own way. So, uh, you know, obedience is, is a tough word to, uh, to, to, to deal with. You know why? Because it takes humility. And, and that is the one thing, uh, if, if I could say that there was one thing lacking in our society, and even in our churches today, I would say it is humility. Humility is lacking. We are all very proud. You know, I want to I believe that what I think 
is 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 just as valid as what you think. I want to believe that what I you know what I believe is just as valid as what anybody else believes. And we we have we have, and that's why we came up with the concept of our truth, right? That's 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 the that's the thing that makes us feel better. It's like oh well, that's your truth and this is my truth. So I can put myself on that same level as as the Word of God and think that, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm just fine because I'm living my truth. So it takes a little humility to understand that your truth is not truth at all. That, there, that truth can only be found in one place, and that is with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to take humility, but humility is the absolute essential in our walk with God. Because in the end, all sin comes down to one thing, and that is pride. It all comes down to that. It's like, I know better. That's what, that's what all sin comes down to. I know better, and I know what's best for me, and I know what I'm doing. It doesn't matter what God's Word says, I know better. In Micah 6.8, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. James 4.6, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that verse in particular strikes me. It strikes me right at my core because it isn't just that that God disagrees with you. It says that God opposes the proud. And that's a pretty serious statement when you stop and think about it. See, we have this idea of God as, as some harmless little grandfather figure, right? You know, grand, grandpas are the best, right? Because grandpa, no matter what you want to do, grandpa's like, oh yeah, whatever. You want cake for dinner? Yeah, praise God, you know. You can have cake for dinner. They're giving you cake, and I can say, here, yeah, go home to mom now. You know? <laughs> grandfathers are the best, and that's why we want to think that God is a grandfather. Whatever we want to know, oh, yeah, no, that's so cute. Don't worry about it. We forget. You know, sometimes, you know, in this relationship that we have with God, and I'm always, I'm always harping on that, right? You guys know this. Every week, I talk about the relationship that we have with God, and and sometimes, and and I think this is, you know, I, I can I can uh, take responsibility for this as well. Sometimes we forget who God is. You know, yes, God loves us. Yes, He is, He wants a relationship with us. Yes, He He cares about what we do. He cares about how we are. He cares about how we feel. But He is God. He is God Almighty the creator of the universe. And we forget about that. He is the judge of all of creation. And that's the part that we have trouble with. Because none of us believe that we deserve judgment. We all believe, oh, I'm just fine. I'm such a good person. God's going to let me in heaven. But we don't understand that God has a law. God, God's standard is absolute and perfect holiness. And that's why Jesus had to die. You know what? If I could get to heaven just by being good, Jesus didn't have to die. He didn't have to suffer on the cross. He didn't have to suffer a, a death that was worse than any other death you can imagine. He didn't have to suffer through all that pain, through the beating and, and the nails in his hands and his feet. He didn't have to go through any of that. If I could just get to heaven on my own, if I could just be good enough to get to heaven... And Jesus was a fool. Because why would he die when I could do it myself? But Jesus wasn't a fool because you know what? We can't. We cannot be good enough for God. And it takes humility to understand that. That no matter how good I think I am, I'm never going to be good enough. I will never measure up to the standard of holiness that God requires. But praise God that I don't have to. Because Jesus did. Jesus substituted his righteousness for mine. So when I come to Jesus Christ and I humbly accept Jesus Christ, I humbly accept him as my Lord and my Savior, 
then when God looks at me, he doesn't see my righteousness. He sees Jesus. That's how I'm able to get to heaven. Because when I, get, when I stand before God, he doesn't see my sin. He doesn't see how, how often I mess up. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm good enough because of that. But it takes humility to understand that, that it's not me. Now that doesn't, that, now that doesn't free us from all responsibility. Because as I, as I have said in the past, holiness does matter to God. We may never be completely holy, but the journey is what matters to God. It matters that you are walking in that direction. And that's where obedience comes in. Like we read God's word and we're like, oh, wait a minute. I'm falling short in this area. i got to make some changes. And as James said, he gives us more grace. And I love that. Because God, it, it says that God opposes the proud, but it also says that he shows favor to the humble. So if you're willing to humble yourself, then God is willing to come alongside you. He's willing to lift you up. He's willing to hold you by the hand and say, okay, this is the way you do this. And, I have, and I've experienced that over the 20 years since I came back to the Lord. Little by little, it didn't happen overnight. I didn't go from being a sinner and, and, and a prodigal to being, uh, to being a preacher overnight. It was a very long process. And made longer by the fact that I'm about the most hard-headed person you'll ever meet. You know? But it was a long process, just, just getting a little bit better every single day until the Lord prepared me to be here, to be pastor. And I'm not worthy of that. But praise be to God that I don't have to be. All I have to be is obedient to God. I have to humble myself and understand that God's law is perfect. That whatever I think, whatever I feel, does not matter compared to the word of God. And we've all got to come to that, that, that situation. We've all got to come to that mental state and understand that my truth doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is God's truth. I probably lost all the rest of the uh, viewers on Facebook by now. <laughs> but you know what? Obedience is the only way you are going to see God's blessing in your life. Now let's look at a, at a story in, uh, in, in Samuel, right? The, the Lord... The Lord wanted to be Israel's king, but Israel kept going their own way. The Bible says over and over and over again that Israel had no king. In those days, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And, and you know, the Lord would send nations to oppress them in order to discipline them. And they would cry out to God, and he would rescue them over and over and over again. And one day they finally came to Samuel. Samuel was the last of the judges. And they said, Samuel, we want a king. We want a king who will rule over us, and he will, he will go out to battle for us, and, and all, just like all the other nations have. And so the Lord gave them a king. And this king was named Saul. And the Bible says that he was a head taller than everybody else. And everybody saw him, and they were amazed. And they made him king. But... And, and the Lord told Saul, if you will obey me, I will establish your kingdom. But Saul did not obey God. On two different occasions, God sent them on a specific mission, and he failed both times. And so God, God, you know, Samuel came and told him, because you were not obedient, God has taken the kingdom away from you. And he's given it to someone after his own heart. And then King David rose and the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. David, who was, who was a shorter person, the Bible says that he was, but he was good looking. He was in the prime of health, but he was forgotten. He was the last of his brothers, the last born child in a family of eight. In a, with eight sons, okay? He was the last one. He was, he was uh, sent off to, to, to tend the sheep so that they didn't have to deal with him. And we can see the rivalry that, that existed between David and his brothers. When he goes to the, to the battle to check on his brothers, his father sends him to the battle with the Philistines where he, where he meets Goliath. 
And when he's asking about what's going on with Goliath, his brothers are yell at him and say, what are you doing? I know, how, I, I know how you are. You just came to watch the battle. And David says, what? Can I even talk? And you can see the rivalry that existed there. They did not think very highly of King David. Or, well, David. He wasn't king at that time. They didn't think very highly of David. And yet this is the guy that God chose. This is the one that God elevated to be king. Why? Because the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. That was the only requirement. See, Saul went his own way. Saul decided to do things his way. And because of that, God removed him from the kingship and removed his family completely. And he brought in David. And he said David would, would be a king. That one of his descendants would sit on the throne forever. Why? Because he was a man after God's own heart. Because he obeyed God. And that's the key. If you want blessings in your life, look, we all want that, right? Just raise your hand. Yes, I want, I want God's blessings in my life. Every one of us want God's blessings in our life. You know the key to God's blessing in your life? It's obedience. It is being a person after God's own heart. Obeying God in everything that we do. And you know what? It, it, it always comes down to knowing what God requires of us, right? It's like, how am I going to be obedient if I don't know? Well, how are you going to know if you don't open your Bible? You want to know what God requires of you? Open your Bible. Open your Bible and read it. Every single day. And you will know what God requires of you. And you know what? God's laws are not burdensome. See, I hate that. I, I hate that characterization that people think, oh, there's so many rules in the church. You know what? Here's the thing. And I told this to somebody once, and, 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 and they didn't know how to answer me. Every one of us lives by a set of rules. Okay? It's just that simple. You may not like the rules of the church, but you have your own. And I may not like the rules that you live by. And that's what I'm saying. It's like, you, you know, you shun the quote-unquote rules of the church so that you can follow your own rules. But every one of us follows a set of rules. Like, I, personally, I would never kill a human being. No matter what they did to me. That's one of my rules. I think we can all relate to that, right? Maybe. <laughs> Depends on what they do to you, right? But that's one of my rules. And then, you know, you don't have to be in church to have a rule like that, but we all have rules that we live by. And so what, why is it any different? As a matter of fact, let's, let's go back to the relationship analogy. There are certain rules in your relationships, right? Like, I can't go around slapping my wife all the time, right? Or, or at all. Or at all. Let me, let me rephrase that. I wouldn't do it anyway because I have to sleep with my eyes open. Let me tell you something. My wife ain't one of those who's going to sit by and be abused. I, I guarantee you that. It's one of the things I love about her. But no, I can't go around slapping my wife. Why? Because that would be wrong. And we would not have a relationship if I did that. Well, why is your relationship with God any different? See, this is the thing that people can't, can't seem to answer uh, me on. It's like, if you, you, know, you have rules in your relationships. We all have relationships. Although I don't know with the millennials nowadays because they just, they're, all their relationships are online. So can you really call those relationships? We're, you know, we're raising generations of, of people that are really socially awkward. It, it's crazy. Anyway, I'm, don't turn off the computer. I'm just kidding, okay? <sighs> but anyway, you want the blessings in your life. Just like if, if I want the blessings of being married to my wife, then I follow certain rules in my relationship with my wife. And you know what? I receive a lot in return for the things that I do in our relationship. Same thing with my children or with my, with my mother or my siblings. There are certain rules that we have in our relationships, and you have, you have all the same rules in your relationships. Why is it any different in, with your relationship with God? See, if I, were being, you know, if I were not being a good husband to my wife, then I would receive negative consequences in our relationship. And we've had a period of, uh, of time like that. You know, I was not a very good husband at first because I didn't know what it meant to be a good husband. And our relationship was not very good. And so I suffered the consequences of, uh, of, of violating the rules of our relationship. And today, 
I've learned what it is to be a good husband and what it is to be her husband specifically. And now I'm reaping the benefits of, of being obedient to those rules. Our relationship with God is no different. You know, when, we have, when you have a relationship with someone, there's a certain way you should treat that person if you want to be in relationship with that person. Well, it just so happens that we are in relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are in relationship with the Lord over all creation. And there's a certain way you have to act when you are in relationship with that person. Just like there's a certain way that you probably have to act if you're in relationship with the President of the United States. If you have a personal relationship with the President of the United States, there's a certain way you acted with that person before they became President. But there's going to be a certain way you have to act with that person after they become president, no matter how close the two of you are. There's a certain level of respect that the office requires. It's the same thing with God. God is the ruler over creation. He demands a certain level of respect. But praise be to God, because his view towards you, the way he looks at you, is as a child is as a, 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 an object of love. And we, can, and we can rest in that. See, God wants to bless you. He wants to lavish his attention on you. But we have to show him respect before he can do that. In the same way that I have to show my wife respect so that I, I get the benefit of my relationship with her. Luke 18, 9-14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, I think Jesus is telling us that it's not about our religious practice. It doesn't matter how often you fast. It doesn't matter how much you give. It doesn't matter how often you're here at church. What matters is what's in here. What do you believe about God? Are you willing to obey God no matter what it is that he tells you? And I think that's, I think that's the problem that many people have. And I've heard this, I, I mean, through the years I've heard this countless times. You know, when, when people tell you, you know, people are going out, they're gambling and they're drinking and they're running around. And it's like, oh, but I go to church once a week. Wow. Congratulations. And that's, that's supposed to make God happy. I just, I, just, I simply don't understand that, guys. I mean, it, 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 you know, I've, I've used this example before. So if, you know, I love my wife, right? I can tell you I love my wife, and I, I, I cook all of our meals, right? I, I do the dishes in, in the house, right? So, okay, so since I cook and I do the dishes in the house, then that means that I can go out and date somebody else, right? <laughs> no. It's silly to think that just because you do certain things, that it's okay to go and be sinful in every other area of your life. Because that doesn't show love for God. It doesn't show respect for God. Just like if I were running around with somebody else, it does not show love and respect for my wife. I can tell you, oh, I love my wife. But are you going to believe that? Of course not. Because you're going to be thinking to yourself, wait, wait, wait. You love your wife, but you're running around with this person. What's well, the same thing? You can say, oh, I love God, and yet you're violating his word at every opportunity. It doesn't matter what you do. Matthew 7, 21-23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I mean, I don't think it gets any plainer than that, right? You can, you, can, you can think that you are serving God by doing certain things. 
But if you haven't asked Jesus Christ into your heart, if you haven't made that step and humbly accepted Jesus Christ's sacrifice for your sin, then in the end, it's not going to amount to anything. Obedience is the way to get God's blessing. Obedience is the way to be in a relationship with God. And obedience shows our love for God. Right? I've said this before. Everybody, everybody tells me, oh, the Bible's all about love. You're right. But see, when people say that, they usually are only talking about God's love for us. They never want to mention our love for God. Obedience is the way that we show that we love God. Jesus said in John 14, 15 through 21, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. See, I show I love my wife by the things I do for her, by being respectful to her, by by shut, you know, as as I said in our in our wedding ceremony, by forsaking all others. That's how I show my love for my wife. That's how you know that I love my wife. But in the same way, you, you know, we show that we love God by being obedient to His commands, by being humble in His presence. That's how we show that we love the Lord. First John five three and four. This is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that, that has overcome the world, even our faith. And I want to emphasize that, guys. His laws are not burdensome. Are there things that have to change in us? Yes. Are there uh, truths that you have come to believe that you may have to change? There, are there things that you think now that you may have to rethink? Yes. But God's laws are not burdensome. You see, God offers us peace. Real peace. Jesus said that, that he would give us peace, not as the world gives. See, because the world offers a type of peace. But it's not peace at all. And we've seen this. There are plenty of people in the world who have lived at peace with the world, but then they say one thing wrong, and all of a sudden they're canceled, and everybody's against them. See, the world doesn't offer real peace. God offers real peace. See, I could say one thing wrong, and God's not going to cancel me, and shun me, and tell me, you can't be in my kingdom anymore. No, because I can come back to him and say, Lord, I recognize that that was wrong, and I'm sorry. And you know what God does? He forgives me. That's peace, guys. That's real peace. I know that even if I mess up, God's not going to cancel me. Now, again, are there things that I've had to rethink in my life? Yes. Are there, are there behaviors that I have had to modify in my life? Yes. Has it been worth it? Absolutely, yes. Because God has given me so much more than I have sacrificed. As the Bible says, God's laws are not burdensome. See, God is willing to come alongside you. God is willing to just pour out blessing after blessing after blessing in your life. And yet we hold on to these little things. We hold on to these little things that are not doing us any good. And this is the thing that drives me crazy. And I, and I see this in, in a lot of the people's lives that I know personally. And they're just hanging on to their, their unbelief. They're hanging on to these little things. And, and things go wrong. And they're not at peace. And they call me up and I say, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm doing. And, and, and I want to shake them sometimes. It's like, come back to Jesus already. But I can't force people to, to accept the peace of God. I don't understand why that's so hard. But we get so we get so emotional about the things that we believe, right? 
Like, I just want to believe what I believe. No, see, people don't want to know the truth. They just want to be told that whatever they believe is the truth. I guess there's some comfort in that. But it's, you know, it, 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 it doesn't take a lot to understand that the way that you're walking doesn't work. And that the reason you're feeling uh, the way that you're feeling is because you need God. Every single one of us needs a relationship with God. That is how we were created. We were created for a relationship with God. And no other relationships, no other uh, thing will ever take the place of that. And as long as you are chasing after whatever it is that you're chasing after, you will always feel incomplete. You will always feel that little emptiness in your heart. You just got to take that step and understand that God's ways are better than your ways. I know that's not easy. I'm not here to tell you that it is. But I'm here to tell you that it's worth it. As someone who's been there, as someone who's gone his own way for a very long time, I can tell you that it is worth it to stop going your own way and to start going God's way. Finally, obedience shows that we actually believe in God. Look, faith is absolutely essential to our walk with the Lord. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 11 says that it is, it is uh, impossible to please God without faith. You've simply got to believe. And that is where, uh, that is where we stumble, because we don't fully believe in God. We can say we believe in God, but when trouble comes, we panic. And we're all we're all like, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. What do I do? How do I fix this? And I always, you know, and people call me because they know what I'm going to tell them. They know that I'm going to, you know, they know that I'm going to calm them down. And I have I have several people that will call me when they're in trouble, and because they know that I'm going to answer them calmly, and I'm going to tell them, guess what? God is in control. You may not feel like things are, are in control, but God is absolutely in control. And we can believe that. And when we are obedient to God, no matter what happens, see, Abraham's obedience was tested by God. God told him, I'm going to give you a son. And that son is, is going to turn into a great nation, and I'm going to multiply your descendants like the sand on the seashore. And at a hundred years old, God gave him his son, his son Isaac. And when Isaac, I believe, was 14 years old, God said, hey, Abraham, you know that son I gave you? That son that you love so much? I want you to take him on the mountain and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Can you imagine what he was thinking when God told him that? Can you imagine what he was thinking in that moment. And yet, he got up early the next day and he went out with the intention of sacrificing his son. Praise God that God stopped him and, and told him not to sacrifice Isaac. But the fact of the matter was he was willing to go. He was willing to trust God even when God, what God was telling him to do didn't make sense to him. He believed with all of his heart God must have a plan here. And later on in the New Testament, we read where Abraham probably believed that God would raise him from the dead even after he killed him. He said, hey, God has the power to raise him up even if I kill him. Even if I sacrifice him, God has the power. He believed God. And that's what the Bible says. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Do you believe God? Even when things don't make sense. When things are going wrong, even though you're doing, quote unquote, doing the right things. Do you believe God? Obedience shows that we actually believe in God. I've known way too many people who, who come to the Lord and they're obedient for a while. And then things go wrong and all of a sudden they turn their back on God. Because they didn't actually believe 
in the goodness of God. They didn't actually believe that God would work everything for good. Now look, it's hard. It's hard when, you're, when your children don't serve the Lord. It's hard to, to really trust in that sometimes. It's hard to, to, to think to yourself, no, no, God's working everything for good. When you see uh, a tragedy strike, as, as, our, as with our sister, her, her, her daughter gets, gets murdered. I mean, it's, it's hard to see the goodness in that. It's hard to see God's plan in that. It's hard to see where God is working in that. But we have to believe because the Bible says that God knows the end from the beginning. And we know that God is good. We know that he is good because of the cross. And when tragedy strikes, when things happen that we don't understand, we need to remember the cross. It's the only thing that makes these situations make sense. In the end, God will work it out. But we have to remain obedient to Him. Bow your heads, church. Oh, Heavenly Father, this was a little more emotional than I intended it to be. But we pray, Lord. We pray for this family, Lord, that has endured this tragedy. I don't understand it, dear God. I'm not going to pretend that I do. None of us understand why something like this has happened. But praise be to God that I don't have to understand all of the reasons. The one thing I have to understand is that you are good. And I know that you are good because of the cross. And so, Heavenly Father, I trust in your goodness towards this family. I trust that you will lay your hands upon them. I trust that you will give them peace. And everyone and everyone here that, that knows them, I trust, will reach out to them and, and provide their own comfort in your name, dear God. But in the end, it has to be you, dear God, because there's nothing we can do to heal this kind of hurt. And so we pray for this family, Lord Jesus. We pray that your goodness will shine down on them. We pray that your peace will envelop them. We pray that your love will absolutely wrap them tightly in your embrace, Lord. That is our prayer. Bless these people as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Joel's viewing is Saturday, April 22nd from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Services uh, will be at 10 a.m. Um, at Salem, Salem Baptist Church of Abington, 2741 Woodland Road, Abington, PA, 19001. All right. I hope you guys got all that, but we will be posting it as well.